Chapter Twenty Two of the Trespasser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Twenty Two. Siegmund went up to Victoria. He was in no hurry to get down to Wimbledon. London was warm and exhausted after the hot day, but this peculiar lukewarmness was not unpleasant to him. He chose to walk from Victoria to Waterloo. The streets were like polished gunmetal, glistened over with gold. The taxicabs, the wildcats of the town, swept over the gleaming floor swiftly soon lessening in the distance as if scornful of the other clumsy-footed traffic he heard the merry click-clock of the swinging hansoms then the excited whirring of the motor-buses as they charged full tilt heavily down the road their hearts as it seemed beating with trepidation they drew up with a sigh of relief by the curb and stood there panting great nervous clumsy things siegmund was always amused by the headlong floundering career of the buses he was pleased with this scampering of the traffic anything for distraction he was glad helena was not with him for the streets would have irritated her with their coarse noise she would stand for a long time to watch the rabbits pop and hobble along the common at night but the tearing along of the taxis and the charge of a great motor-bus was painful to her discords she said after the trees and sea she liked the glistening of the streets it seemed a fine alloy of gold laid down for pavement such pavement as drew near to the pure gold streets of heaven but this noise could not be endured near any wonderland siegmund did not mind it it drummed out his own thoughts he watched the gleaming magic of the road raced over with shadows project itself far before him into the night he watched the people soldiers belted with scarlet went jauntily on in front there was a peculiar charm in their movement there was a soft vividness of life in their carriage it reminded siegmund of the soft swaying and lapping of a poised candle flame the women went blithely alongside occasionally in passing one glanced at him then in spite of himself he smiled he knew not why the women glanced at him with approval for he was ruddy besides he had that carelessness and abstraction of despair the eyes of the women said you are comely you are lovable and siegmund smiled when the street opened at westminster he noticed the city sky a lovely deep purple and the lamps in the square steaming out a vapour of grey-gold light it is a wonderful night he said to himself there are not two such in a year he went forward to the embankment with a feeling of elation in his heart this purple and gold-grey world with the fluttering flame warmth of soldiers and the quick brightness of women like lights that clip sharply in a draught was a revelation to him as he leaned upon the embankment parapet the wonder did not fade but rather increased the trams one after another floated loftily over the bridge they went like great burning bees in an endless file into a hive past those which were drifting dreamily out while below on the black distorted water 
golden serpents flashed and twisted to and fro ah said siegmund to himself it is far too wonderful for me here as well as by the sea the night is gorgeous and uncouth whatever happens the world is wonderful so he went on amid all the vast miracle of movement in the city night the swirling of water to the sea the gradual sweep of the stars the floating of many lofty luminous cars through the bridged darkness like an army of angels filing past on one of god's campaigns the purring haste of the taxis the slightly dancing shadows of people siegmund went on slowly like a slow bullet winging into the heart of life he did not lose this sense of wonder not in the train nor as he walked home in the moonless dark when he closed the door behind him and hung up his hat he frowned he did not think definitely of anything but his frown meant to him now for the beginning of hell he went towards the dining-room where the light was and the uneasy murmur the clock with its deprecating suave chime was striking ten Siegmund opened the door of the room. Beatrice was sewing, and did not raise her head. Frank, a tall, thin lad of eighteen, was bent over a book. He did not look up. Vera had her fingers thrust in among her hair, and continued to read the magazine that lay on the table before her. Siegmund looked at them all they gave no sign to show they were aware of his entry there was only that unnatural tenseness of people who cover their agitation he glanced round to see where he should go his wicker armchair remained by the fireplace his slippers were standing under the sideboard as he had left them siegmund sat down in the creaking chair he began to feel sick and tired. "'I suppose the children are in bed,' he said. His wife sewed on as if she had not heard him. His daughter noisily turned over a leaf and continued to read, as if she were pleasantly interested and had known no interruption. Siegmund waited, with his slipper dangling from his hand, looking from one to another. "'They've been gone two hours,' said Frank at last, still without raising his eyes from the book. His tone was contemptuous, his voice was jarring, not yet having developed a man's fullness. Siegmund put on his slipper, and began to unlace the other boot. The slurring of the lace through the holes and the snacking of the tag seemed unnecessarily loud. It annoyed his wife. She took a breath to speak, then refrained, feeling suddenly her daughter's scornful restraint upon her. Siegmund rested his arms upon his knees and sat leaning forward looking into the barren fireplace which was littered with paper and orange peel and a banana skin do you want any supper asked beatrice and the sudden harshness of her voice startled him into looking at her she had her face averted refusing to see him siegmund's heart went down with weariness and despair at the sight of her aren't you having any he asked the table was not laid beatrice's work-basket a little wicker fruit skep overflowed scissors and pins and scraps of holland and reels of cotton on the green serge cloth vera leaned both her elbows on the table instead of replying to him beatrice went to the sideboard she took out a tablecloth pushing her sewing-litter aside, 
and spread the cloth over one end of the table. Vera gave her magazine a little knock with her hand. "'Have you read this tale of a French convent school in here, mother?' she asked. "'In where?' "'In this month's Nash's.' "'No,' replied Beatrice. "'What time have I for reading, much less for anything else?' You should think more of yourself and a little less of other people, then," said Vera, with a sneer at the other people. She rose. Let me do this. You sit down. You are tired, mother," she said. Her mother, without replying, went out to the kitchen. Vera followed her. Frank, left alone with his father, moved uneasily and bent his thin shoulders lower over his book. Siegmund remained with his arms on his knees, looking into the grate. From the kitchen came the chinking of crockery, and soon the smell of coffee. All the time Vera was heard chatting with affected brightness to her mother, addressing her in fond tones using all her wits to recall bright little incidents to retail to her. Beatrice answered rarely, and then with the utmost brevity. Presently Vera came in with the tray. She put down a cup of coffee, a plate with boiled ham, pink and thin, such as is bought from a grocer, and some bread and butter. Then she sat down, noisily turning over the leaves of her magazine. Frank glanced at the table. It was laid solely for his father. He looked at the bread and the meat, but restrained himself, and went on reading, or pretended to do so. Beatrice came in with the small cruet. It was conspicuously bright. Everything was correct knife and fork, spoon, cruet, all perfectly clean, the crockery fine, the bread and butter thin. In fact, it was just as it would have been for a perfect stranger. This scrupulous neatness, in a household so slovenly and easy-going, where it was an established tradition that something should be forgotten or wrong, impressed Siegmund. Beatrice put the serving-knife and fork by the little dish of ham, saw that all was proper, then went and sat down. Her face showed no emotion. It was calm and proud. She began to sew. "'What do you say, mother?' said Vera, as if resuming a conversation. "'Shall it be Hampton Court or Richmond on Sunday?' "'I say, as I said before,' replied Beatrice, "'I cannot afford to go out.' "'But you must begin, my dear, and Sunday shall see the beginning. Dites donc.' "'There are other things to think of,' said Beatrice. "'Now, maman, nous avons changé tout cela. We are going out. A jolly little razzle.' Vera, who was rather handsome, lifted up her face and smiled at her mother gaily. "'I am afraid there will be no razzle,' Beatrice accented the word, smiling slightly, "'for me. You are slangy, Vera.' "'Un doux argot, ma mère. You look tired.' Beatrice glanced at the clock. "'I will go to bed when I have cleared the table,' she said. Siegmund winced. He was still sitting with his head bent down, looking into the grate. Vera went on to say something more. Presently Frank looked up at the table, and remarked in his grating voice, "'There's your supper, father.' The women stopped and looked round at this. Siegmund bent his head lower. Vera resumed her talk. It died out, and there was silence. Siegmund was hungry. Oh, good Lord, good Lord, bread of humiliation to-night, he said to himself, before he could muster courage to rise and go to the table. 
he seemed to be shrinking inwards the women glanced swiftly at him and away from him as his chair creaked and he got up frank was watching from under his eyebrows siegmund went through the ordeal of eating and drinking in presence of his family if he had not been hungry he could not have done it despite the fact that he was content to receive humiliation this night he swallowed the coffee with effort when he had finished he sat irresolute for some time then he arose and went to the door good night he said nobody made any reply frank merely stirred in his chair siegmund shut the door and went there was absolute silence in the room till they heard him turn on the tap in the bathroom then beatrice began to breathe spasmodically catching her breath as if she would sob but she restrained herself the faces of the two children set hard with hate he is not worth the flicking of your little finger mother said vera beatrice moved about with pitiful groping hands collecting her sewing and her cottons at any rate he's come back red enough said frank in his grating tone of contempt he's like boiled salmon beatrice did not answer anything frank rose and stood with his back to the grate in his father's characteristic attitude he would come slinking back in a funk he said with a young man's sneer stretching forward he put a piece of ham between two pieces of bread and began to eat the sandwich in large bites vera came to the table at this and began to make herself a more dainty sandwich frank watched her with jealous eyes there is a little more ham if you'd like it said beatrice to him i kept you some all right ma he replied fetch it in beatrice went out to the kitchen and bring the bread and butter too will you called vera after her the damned coward ain't he a rotten funker said frank sotto voce while his mother was out of the room vera did not reply but she seemed tacitly to agree they petted their mother while she waited on them at length frank yawned he fidgeted a moment or two then he went over to his mother and putting his hand on her arm the feel of his mother's round arm under the black silk sleeve made his tears rise he said more gratingly than ever ne'er mind ma we'll be all right to you then he bent and kissed her good night mother he said awkwardly and he went out of the room beatrice was crying End of chapter 22 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 23 of The Trespasser This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence Chapter Twenty Three. I shall never re establish myself, said Siegmund, as he closed behind him the dining room door and went upstairs in the dark. I am a family criminal. Beatrice might come round, but the children's insolent judgment is too much and i am like a dog that creeps round the house from which it escaped with joy i have nowhere else to go why did i come back but i am sleepy i will not bother to-night he went into the bathroom and washed himself everything he did gave him a grateful sense of pleasure 
notwithstanding the misery of his position he dipped his arms deeper into the cold water that he might feel the delight of it a little farther his neck he swilled time after time and it seemed to him he laughed with pleasure as the water caught him and fell away the towel reminded him how sore were his forehead and his neck blistered both to a state of rawness by the sun he touched them very cautiously to dry them wincing and smiling at his own childish touch and shrink though his bedroom was very dark he did not light the gas instead he stepped out into the small balcony his shirt was open at the neck and wrists he pulled it farther apart baring his chest to the deliciously soft night he stood looking out at the darkness for some time the night was as yet moonless but luminous with a certain atmosphere of light the stars were small near at hand large shapes of trees rose up farther lamps like little mushroom groups shone amid an undergrowth of darkness there was a vague hoarse noise filling the sky like the whispering in a shell and this breathing of the summer night occasionally swelled into a restless sigh as a train roared across the distance what a big night thought siegmund the night gathers everything into a oneness i wonder what is in it he leaned forward over the balcony trying to catch something out of the night he felt his soul like tendrils stretched out anxiously to grasp a hold what could he hold to in this great hoarse breathing night a star fell it seemed to burst into sight just across his eyes with a yellow flash he looked up unable to make up his mind whether he had seen it or not there was no gap in the sky it is a good sign a shooting star he said to himself it is a good sign for me i know i am right that was my sign having assured himself he stepped indoors unpacked his bag and was soon in bed this is a good bed he said and the sheets are very fresh he lay for a little while with his head bending forwards looking from his pillow out at the stars then he went to sleep at half past six in the morning he suddenly opened his eyes what is it he asked and almost without interruption answered well i've got to go through it his sleep had shaped him perfect premonition which like a dream he forgot when he awoke only this naive question and answer betrayed what had taken place in his sleep immediately he awoke this subordinate knowledge vanished another fine day was striding in triumphant the first thing siegmund did was to salute the morning because of its brightness the second thing was to call to mind the aspect of that bay in the isle of wight what would it just be like now he said to himself he had to give his heart some justification for the peculiar pain left in it from his sleep activity so he began poignantly to long for the place which had been his during the last mornings he pictured the garden with roses and nasturtiums he remembered the sunny way down the shore and all the expanse of sea hung softly between the tall white cliffs it is impossible it is gone he cried to himself it can't be gone i looked forward to it as if it never would come it can't be gone now helena is not lost to me surely 
then he began a long pining for the departed beauty of his life he turned the jewel of memory and facet by facet it wounded him with its brilliant loveliness this pain though it was keen was half pleasure presently he heard his wife stirring she opened the door of the room next to his and he heard her frank it's a quarter to eight you will be late all right mother why didn't you call me sooner grumbled the lad i didn't wake myself i didn't go to sleep till morning and then i slept she went downstairs siegmund listened for his son to get out of bed the minutes passed the young donkey why doesn't he get out said siegmund angrily to himself he turned over pressing himself upon the bed in anger and humiliation because now he had no authority to call to his son and keep him to his duty siegmund waited writhing with anger shame and anxiety when the suave velvety pan pan of the clock was heard striking frank stepped with a thud onto the floor he could be heard dressing in clumsy haste beatrice called from the bottom of the stairs do you want any hot water you know there isn't time for me to shave now answered her son lifting his voice to a kind of broken falsetto the scent of the cooking of bacon filled the house siegmund heard his second daughter marjorie aged nine talking to vera who occupied the same room with her the child was evidently questioning and the elder girl answered briefly there was a lull in the household noises broken suddenly by marjorie shouting from the top of the stairs mum she wailed mum still beatrice did not hear her mum mamma beatrice was in the scullery mamma the child was getting impatient she lifted her voice and shouted mum mamma still no answer Mummy! she squealed siegmund could hardly contain himself why don't you go down and ask vera called crossly from the bedroom and at the same moment beatrice answered also crossly what do you want where's my stockings cried the child at the top of her voice why do you ask me are they down here replied her mother what are you shouting for the child plodded downstairs directly she returned and as she passed into vera's room she grumbled and now they're not mended siegmund heard a sound that made his heart beat it was the crackling of the sides of the crib as Gwen, his little girl of five, climbed out. She was silent for a space. He imagined her sitting on the white rug and pulling on her stockings. Then there came the quick little thud of her feet as she went downstairs. Mum, Siegmund heard her say as she went down the hall, has Dad come? the answer and the child's further talk were lost in the distance of the kitchen the small anxious question and the quick thudding of gwen's feet made siegmund lie still with torture he wanted to hear no more he lay shrinking within himself it seemed that his soul was sensitive to madness he felt that he could not come what might get up and meet them all the front door banged and he heard frank's hasty call good-bye evidently the lad was in an ill humour siegmund listened for the sound of the train it seemed an age the boy would catch it 
then the water from the wash-hand bowl in the bathroom ran loudly out that he suggested was vera who was evidently not going up to town at the thought of this siegmund almost hated her he listened for her to go downstairs it was nine o'clock the footsteps of beatrice came upstairs she put something down in the bathroom his hot water siegmund listened intently for her to come to his door would she speak she approached hurriedly knocked and waited siegmund startled for the moment could not answer she knocked loudly all right said he then she went downstairs he lay probing and torturing himself for another half hour till vera's voice said coldly beneath his window outside you should clear away then we don't want the breakfast things on the table for a week siegmund's heart set hard he rose with a shut mouth and went across to the bathroom there he started the quaint figure of gwen stood at the bowl her back was towards him she was sponging her face gingerly her hair all bloused from the pillow was tied in a stiff little pigtail standing out from her slender childish neck her arms were bare to the shoulder she wore a bodiced petticoat of pink flannelette which hardly reached her knees siegmund felt slightly amused to see her stout little calves planted so firmly close together she carefully sponged her cheeks her pursed-up mouth and her neck soaping her hair but not her ears then very deliberately she squeezed out the sponge and proceeded to wipe away the soap for some reason or other she glanced round her startled eyes met his she too had beautiful dark blue eyes she stood with the sponge at her neck looking full at him siegmund felt himself shrinking the child's look was steady calm inscrutable hello said her father are you here the child without altering her expression in the slightest turned her back on him and continued wiping her neck she dropped the sponge in the water and took the towel from off the side of the bath then she turned to look again at siegmund who stood in his pyjamas before her his mouth shut hard but his eyes shrinking and tender she seemed to be trying to discover something in him have you washed your ears he said gaily she paid no heed to this except that he noticed her face now wore a slight constrained smile as she looked at him she was shy still she continued to regard him curiously there is some chocolate on my dressing-table he said where have you been to she said suddenly to the seaside he answered smiling to brighton she asked her tone was still condemning much farther than that he replied to worthing she asked father in a steamer he replied but who did you go with asked the child why i went all by myself he answered twooly she asked really and twooly he answered laughing couldn't you take me she asked i will next time he replied the child looked at him unsatisfied but what did you go for she asked goading him suspiciously to see the sea and the ships and the fighting ships with cannons you might have taken me said the child reproachfully yes i ought to have done oughtn't i he said as if regretful gwen still looked full at him you are red she said he glanced quickly in the glass and replied 
that is the sun hasn't it been hot mm, it made my nose all peel vera said she would scrape me like a new potato the child laughed and turned shyly away come here said siegmund i believe you've got a tooth out haven't you he was very cautious and gentle the child drew back he hesitated and she drew away from him unwilling come and let me look he repeated she drew farther away and the same constrained smile appeared on her face shy suspicious condemning aren't you going to get your chocolate he asked as the child hesitated in the doorway she glanced into his room and answered i've got to go to ma'am and have my hair done her awkwardness and her lack of compliance insulted him she went downstairs without going into his room siegmund rebuffed by the only one in the house from whom he might have expected friendship proceeded slowly to shave feeling sick at heart he was a long time over his toilet when he stripped himself for the bath it seemed to him he could smell the sea he bent his head and licked his shoulder it tasted decidedly salt a pity to wash it off he said as he got up dripping from the cold bath he felt for the moment exhilarated he rubbed himself smooth glancing down at himself he thought i look young i look as young as twenty-six he turned to the mirror there he saw himself a mature complete man of forty with grave years of experience on his countenance i used to think that when i was forty he said to himself i should find everything straight as the nose on my face walking through my affairs as easily as you like now i am no more sure of myself have no more confidence than a boy of twenty what can i do it seems to me a man needs a mother all his life i don't feel much like a lord of creation having arrived at this cynicism siegmund prepared to go downstairs his sensitiveness had passed off his nerves had become callous when he was dressed he went down to the kitchen without hesitation he was indifferent to his wife and children no one spoke to him as he sat to the table that was as he liked it he wished for nothing to touch him he ate his breakfast alone while his wife bustled about upstairs and and vera bustled about in the dining-room then he retired to the solitude of the drawing-room as a reaction against his poetic activity he felt as if he were gradually becoming more stupid and blind he remarked nothing not even the extravagant bowl of grasses placed where he would not have allowed it on his piano nor his fiddle laid cruelly on the cold polished floor near the window he merely sat down in an armchair and felt sick all his unnatural excitement all the poetic stimulation of the past few days had vanished he felt flaccid while his life struggled slowly through him after an intoxication of passion and love and beauty and of sunshine he was prostrate like a plant that blossoms gorgeously and madly he had wasted the tissue of his strength so that now his life struggled in a clogged and broken channel siegmund sat with his head between his hands leaning upon the table he would have been stupidly quiescent in his feeling of loathing and sickness had not an intense irritability in all his nerves tormented him into consciousness 
i suppose this is the result of the sun a sort of sunstroke he said realizing an intolerable stiffness of his brain a stunned condition in his head this is hideous he said his arms were quivering with intense irritation he exerted all his will to stop them and then the hot irritability commenced in his belly siegmund fidgeted in his chair without changing his position he had not the energy to get up and move about he fidgeted like an insect pinned down the door opened he felt violently startled yet there was no movement perceptible vera entered ostensibly for an autograph album into which she was going to copy a drawing from the london opinion really to see what her father was doing he did not move a muscle he only longed intensely for his daughter to go out of the room so that he could let go vera went out of the drawing-room humming to herself apparently she had not even glanced at her father in reality she had observed him closely he is sitting with his head in his hands she said to her mother beatrice replied i'm glad he's nothing else to do i should think he's pitying himself said vera he's a good one at it answered beatrice gwen came forward and took hold of her mother's skirt looking up anxiously what is he doing ma'am she asked nothing replied her mother nothing only sitting in the drawing-room but what has he been doing persisted the anxious child nothing nothing that i can tell you he's only spoilt all our lives the little girl stood regarding her mother in the greatest distress and perplexity but what will he do ma'am she asked nothing don't bother run away and play with marjorie now do you want a nice plum she took a yellow plum from the table gwen accepted it without a word she was too much perplexed what do you say asked her mother thank you replied the child turning away siegmund sighed with relief when he was again left alone he twisted in his chair and sighed again trying to drive out the intolerable clawing irritability from his belly oh this is horrible he said he stiffened his muscles to quieten them i've never been like this before what is the matter he asked himself but the question died out immediately it seemed useless and sickening to try and answer it he began to cast about for an alleviation if he could only do something or have something he wanted it would be better what do i want he asked himself and he anxiously strove to find this out everything he suggested to himself made him sicken with weariness or distaste the seaside a foreign land a fresh life that he had often dreamed of farming in canada i should be just the same there he answered himself just the same sickening feeling there that i want nothing helena he suggested to himself trembling but he only felt a deeper horror the thought of her made him shrink convulsively i can't endure this he said if this is the case i had better be dead to have no want no desire that is death to begin with he rested a while after this the idea of death alone seemed entertaining then is there really nothing i could turn to he asked himself 
to him in that state of soul it seemed there was not helena he suggested again appealingly testing himself ah oh, no he cried drawing sharply back as from an approaching touch upon a raw place he groaned slightly as he breathed with a horrid weight of nausea there was a fumbling upon the doorknob siegmund did not start he merely pulled himself together gwen pushed open the door and stood holding on to the doorknob looking at him dad mam says dinner's ready she announced siegmund did not reply the child waited at a loss for some moments before she repeated in a hesitating tone dinner's ready all right said siegmund go away the little girl returned to the kitchen with tears in her eyes very crestfallen what did he say asked beatrice he shouted at me replied the little one breaking into tears beatrice flushed tears came into her own eyes she took the child in her arms and pressed her to her kissing her forehead did he she said very tenderly never mind then dearie never mind the tears in her mother's voice made the child sob bitterly vera and marjorie sat silent at table the steak and mashed potatoes steamed and grew cold end of chapter 23 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Twenty Four of the Trespasser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Trespasser, by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Twenty Four. When Helena arrived home on the Thursday evening, she found everything repulsive all the odours of the sordid street through which she must pass hung about the pavement having crept out in the heat the house was bare and narrow she remembered children sometimes to have brought her moths shut up in match-boxes as she knocked at the door she felt like a numbed moth which a boy is pushing off its leaf-rest into his box the door was opened by her mother she was a woman whose sunken mouth ruddy cheeks and quick brown eyes gave her the appearance of a bird which walks about pecking suddenly here and there as helena reluctantly entered the mother drew herself up and immediately relaxed seeming to peck forwards as she said well well here we are replied the daughter in a matter-of-fact tone her mother was inclined to be affectionate therefore she became proportionately cold so i see exclaimed mrs verdon tossing her head in a peculiar jocular manner and what sort of a time have you had oh very good replied helena still more coolly Hmm. mrs verdon looked keenly at her daughter she recognized the peculiar sulky childish look she knew so well therefore making an effort she forbore to question you look well she said helena smiled ironically and are you ready for your supper she asked in the playful affectionate manner she had assumed if the supper is ready i will have it replied her daughter well it's not ready her mother shut tight her sunken mouth and regarded her daughter with playful challenge 
because she continued i didn't know when you were coming she gave a jerk with her arm like an orator who utters the incontrovertible but she added after a tedious dramatic pause i can soon have it ready what will you have the full list of your capacious larder replied helena mrs verdon looked at her again and hesitated will you have cocoa or lemonade she asked coming to the point curtly lemonade said helena presently mr verdon entered a small white-bearded man with a gentle voice oh so you are back nelly he said in his quiet reserved manner as you see pater she answered hm he murmured and he moved about at his accounts neither of her parents dared to question helena they moved about her on tiptoe stealthily yet neither subserved her her father's quiet hm her mother's curt question made her draw inwards like a snail which can never retreat far enough from condemning eyes she made a careless pretence of eating she was like a child which has done wrong and will not be punished but will be left with the humiliating smear of offence upon it there was a quick light palpitating of the knocker mrs verdon went to the door has she come and there were hasty steps along the passage louisa entered she flung herself upon helena and kissed her how long have you been in she asked in a voice trembling with affection ten minutes replied helena why didn't you send me the time of the train so that i could come and meet you louisa reproached her why drawled helena louisa looked at her friend without speaking she was deeply hurt by this sarcasm as soon as possible helena went upstairs louisa stayed with her that night on the next day they were going to cornwall together for their usual midsummer holiday they were to be accompanied by a third girl a minor friend of louisa a slight acquaintance of helena during the night neither of the two friends slept much helena made confidences to louisa who brooded on these on the romance and tragedy which enveloped the girl she loved so dearly meanwhile helena's thoughts went round and round tethered amid the five days by the sea pulling forwards as far as the morrow's meeting with siegmund but reaching no further friday was an intolerable day of silence broken by little tender advances and playful affectionate sallies on the part of the mother all of which were rapidly repulsed the father said nothing and avoided his daughter with his eyes in his humble reserve there was a dignity which made his disapproval far more difficult to bear than the repeated flagrant questionings of the mother's eyes but the day wore on helena pretended to read and sat thinking she played her violin a little mechanically she went out into the town and wandered about at last the night fell well said helena to her mother i suppose i'd better pack haven't you done it cried mrs verdon exaggerating her surprise you'll never have it done i'd better help you what times does the train go helena smiled ten minutes to ten her mother glanced at the clock it was only half past eight there was ample time for everything nevertheless you'd better look sharp mrs verdon said helena turned away weary of this exaggeration i'll come with you to the station 
suggested mrs verdon i'll see the last of you we shan't see much of you just now helena turned round in surprise oh i wouldn't bother she said fearing to make her disapproval too evident yes i will i'll see you off mrs verdon's animation and indulgence were remarkable usually she was curt and undemonstrative on occasions like these however when she was reminded of the ideal relations between mother and daughter she played the part of the affectionate parent much to the general distress helena lit a candle and went to her bedroom she quickly packed her dress basket as she stood before the mirror to put on her hat her eyes gazing heavily met her heavy eyes in the mirror she glanced away swiftly as if she had been burned how stupid i look she said to herself and siegmund how is he i wonder she wondered how siegmund had passed the day what had happened to him how he felt how he looked she thought of him protectively having strapped her basket she carried it downstairs her mother was ready with a white lace scarf round her neck after a short time louisa came in she dropped her basket in the passage and then sank into a chair i don't want to go nell she said after a few moments of silence why how is that asked helena not surprised but condescending as to a child oh i don't know i'm tired said the other petulantly of course you are what do you expect after a day like this said helena and rushing about packing exclaimed mrs verdon still in an exaggerated manner this time scolding playfully oh i don't know i don't think i want to go dear repeated louisa dejectedly well it is time we set out replied helena rising will you carry the basket or the violin mater louisa rose and with a forlorn expression took up her light luggage the west opposite the door was smouldering with sunset darkness is only smoke that hangs suffocatingly over the low red heat of the sunken day such was helena's longed-for night the tramcar was crowded in one corner olive the third friend rose excitedly to greet them helena sat mute while the car swung through the yellow stale lights of a third-rate street of shops she heard olive remarking on her sunburned face and arms she became aware of the renewed inflammation in her blistered arms she heard her own curious voice answering everything was in a maze to the beat of the car while the yellow blur of the shops passed over her eyes she repeated two hundred and forty miles two hundred and forty miles end of chapter twenty four recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter twenty five of the trespasser this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the trespasser by d h lawrence chapter twenty five siegmund passed the afternoon in a sort of stupor at tea-time Beatrice, who had until then kept herself in restraint, gave way to an outburst of angry hysteria. "'When does your engagement at the comedy theatre commence?' she had asked him coldly. He knew she was wondering about money. "'Tomorrow,' 
if ever he had answered she was aware that he hated the work for some reason or other her anger flashed out like sudden lightning at his if ever what do you think you can do she cried for i think you have done enough we can't do as we like altogether indeed indeed we cannot you have had your fling haven't you you have had your fling and you want to keep on but there's more than one person in the world remember that but there are your children let me remind you whose are they you talk about shirking the engagement but who is going to be responsible for your children do you think i said nothing about shirking the engagement replied siegmund very coldly no there was no need to say i know what it means you sit there sulking all day what do you think i do i have to see to the children i have to work and slave i go on from day to day i tell you i'll stop i tell you i'll do as i like i'll go as well no i wouldn't be such a coward you know that you know i wouldn't leave little children to the workhouse or anything they're my children they mightn't be yours there is no need for this said siegmund contemptuously the pressure in his temples was excruciating and he felt loathsomely sick beatrice's dark eyes flashed with rage isn't there she cried oh isn't there no there is need for a great deal more i don't know what you think i am how much farther do you think you can go no you don't like reminding of us you sit moping sulking because you have to come back to your own children i wonder how much you think i shall stand what do you think i am to put up with it what do you think i am am i a servant to eat out of your hand be quiet shouted siegmund don't i know what you are listen to yourself beatrice was suddenly silenced it was the stillness of white hot wrath even siegmund was glad to hear her voice again she spoke low and trembling you coward you miserable coward it is i is it who am wrong it is i who am to blame is it you miserable thing i have no doubt you know what i am siegmund looked up at her as her words died off she looked back at him with dark eyes loathing his cowed wretched animosity his eyes were bloodshot and furtive his mouth was drawn back in a half grin of hate and misery she was goading him in his darkness whither he had withdrawn himself like a sick dog to die or recover as his strength should prove she tortured him till his sickness was swallowed by anger which glared redly at her as he pushed back his chair to rise he trembled too much however his chin dropped again on his chest beatrice sat down in her place hearing footsteps she was shuddering slightly and her eyes were fixed vera entered with the two children all three immediately as if they found themselves confronted by something threatening stood arrested vera tackled the situation is the table ready to be cleared yet she asked in an unpleasant tone her father's cup was half emptied he had come to tea late after the others had left the table evidently he had not finished but he made no reply neither did beatrice vera glanced disgustedly at her father gwen sidled up to her mother and tried to break the tension ma'am there was a lady had a dog and it ran into a shop and it licked a sheep ma'am what was hanging up beatrice sat fixed and paid not the slightest attention 
the child looked up at her waited then continued softly ma'am there was a lady had a dog don't bother snapped vera sharply the child looked wondering and resentful at her sister vera was taking the things from the table snatching them and thrusting them on the tray gwen's eyes rested a moment or two on the bent head of her father then deliberately she turned again to her mother and repeated in her softest and most persuasive tones ma'am i saw a dog and it ran in a butcher's shop and licked a piece of meat ma'am ma'am there was no answer gwen went forward and put her hand on her mother's knee ma'am she pleaded timidly no response ma'am she whispered she was desperate she stood on tiptoe and pulled with little hands at her mother's breast ma'am she whispered shrilly her mother with an effort of self-denial put off her investment of tragedy and laying her arm round the child's shoulders drew her close gwen was somewhat reassured but not satisfied with an earnest face upturned to the impassive countenance of her mother she began to whisper sibilant coaxing pleading ma'am there was a lady she had a dog vera turned sharply to stop this whispering which was too much for her nerves but the mother forestalled her taking the child in her arms she averted her face put her cheek against the baby cheek and let the tears run freely gwen was too much distressed to cry the tears gathered very slowly in her eyes and fell without her having moved a muscle in her face vera remained in the scullery weeping tears of rage and pity and shame into the towel the only sound in the room was the occasional sharp breathing of beatrice siegmund sat without the trace of a movement almost without breathing his head was ducked low. He dared never lift it. He dared give no sign of his presence. Presently Beatrice put down the child and went to join Vera in the scullery. There came the low sound of women's talking, an angry, ominous sound. Gwen followed her mother. Her little voice could be heard cautiously asking, "'Ma'am, is Dad cross? Is he? What did he do?' "'Don't bother,' snapped Vera. "'You are a little nuisance. Here, take this into the dining-room and don't drop it.' The child did not obey. She stood looking from her mother to her sister. The latter pushed a dish into her hand. "'Go along!' she said gently thrusting the child forth gwen departed she hesitated in the kitchen her father still remained unmoved the child wished to go to him to speak to him but she was afraid she crossed the kitchen slowly hugging the dish then she came slowly back hesitating she sidled into the kitchen she crept round the table inch by inch drawing nearer her father at about a yard from the chair she stopped he from under his bent brows could see her small feet in brown slippers nearly kicked through at the toes waiting and moving nervously near him he pulled himself together as a man does who watches the surgeon's lancet suspended over his wound. Would the child speak to him? Would she touch him with her small hands? He held his breath, and it seemed held his heart from beating. What he should do he did not know. 
he waited in a daze of suspense the child shifted from one foot to another he could just see the edge of her white frilled drawers he wanted above all things to take her in his arms to have something against which to hide his face yet he was afraid often when all the world was hostile he had found her full of love he had hidden his face against her she had gone to sleep in his arms she had been like a piece of apple blossom in his arms if she should come to him now his heart halted again in suspense he knew not what he would do it would open perhaps the tumour of his sickness he was quivering too fast with suspense to know what he feared or wanted or hoped gwen called vera wondering why she did not return gwen yes answered the child and slowly siegmund saw her feet lifted hesitate move then turn away she had gone his excitement sank rapidly and the sickness returned stronger more horrible and wearying than ever for a moment it was so bad that he was afraid of losing consciousness he recovered slightly pulled himself up and went upstairs his fists were tightly clenched his fingers closed over his thumbs which were pressed bloodless he lay down on the bed for two hours he lay in a dazed condition resembling sleep at the end of that time the knowledge that he had to meet helena was actively at work an activity quite apart from his will or his consciousness jogging and pulling him awake at eight o'clock he sat up a cramped pain in his thumbs made him wonder he looked at them and mechanically shut them again under his fingers into the position they sought after two hours of similar constraint siegmund opened his hands again smiling it is said to be the sign of a weak deceitful character he said to himself his head was peculiarly numbed at the back it felt heavy as if weighted with lead he could think only one detached sentence at intervals between whiles there was a blank grey sleep or swoon i have got to go and meet helena at wimbledon he said to himself and instantly he felt a peculiar joy as if he had laughed somewhere but i must be getting ready i can't disappoint her said siegmund the idea of helena woke a craving for rest in him if he should say to her do not go away from me come with me somewhere then he might lie down somewhere beside her and she might put her hands on his head if she could hold his head in her hands for she had fine silken hands that adjusted themselves with a rare pressure wrapping his weakness up in life then his head would gradually grow healed and he could rest this was the one thing that remained for his restoration that she should with long unwearying gentleness put him to rest he longed for it utterly for the hands and the restfulness of helena but it is no good he said staring like a drunken man from sleep what time is it it was ten minutes to nine she would be in wimbledon by ten ten it was time he should be getting ready yet he remained sitting on the bed i am forgetting again he said but i do not want to go what is the good i have only to tie a mask on for the meeting it is too much 
he waited and waited his head dropped forward in a sort of sleep suddenly he started awake the back of his head hurt severely goodness he said it is getting quite dark it was twenty minutes to ten he went bewildered into the bathroom to wash in cold water and bring back his senses his hands were sore and his face blazed with sun inflammation he made himself neat as usual it was ten minutes to ten he would be very late it was practically dark though these bright days were endless he wondered whether the children were in bed it was too late however to wonder siegmund hurried downstairs and took his hat he was walking down the path when the door was snatched open behind him and vera ran out crying are you going out where are you going siegmund stood still and looked at her she is frightened he said to himself smiling ironically i am only going a walk i have to go to wimbledon i shall not be very long wimbledon at this time said vera sharply full of suspicion yes i am late i shall be back in an hour he was sorry for her she knew he gave her an honourable promise you need not keep us sitting up she said he did not answer but hurried to the station end of chapter 25 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter 26 of the trespasser this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the trespasser by d h lawrence chapter 26 helena louisa and olive climbed the steps to go to the southwestern platform they were laden with dress baskets umbrellas and little packages olive and louisa at least were in high spirits olive stopped before the indicator the next train for waterloo she announced in her contralto voice is ten thirty it is now ten twelve we go by the ten forty it is a better train said helena olive turned to her with a heavy arch manner very well dear there is a parting to be got through i am told we sympathize dear but we regret it starting for a holiday is always a prolonged agony but i am strong to endure it you look it you look as if you could tackle a bull cried louisa skittish my dear louisa rang out olive's contralto don't judge me by appearances you're sure to be taken in with me it's a case of oh the gladness of her gladness when she's sad and the sadness of her sadness when she's glad she looked round to see the effect of this helena expected to say something chimed in sarcastically they are nothing to her madness when she's going for a holiday dear cried olive oh go on being mad cried louisa what do you like it i thought you'd be thanking heaven that sanity was given me in large doses and holidays in small laughed louisa good no i like your madness if you call it such you are always so serious it's ill talking of halters in the house of the hanged dear boomed olive she looked from side to side she felt triumphant helena smiled acknowledging the sarcasm but 
said louisa smiling anxiously i don't quite see it what's the point well to be explicit dear replied olive it is hardly safe to accuse me of sadness and seriousness in this trio louisa laughed and shook herself come to think of it it isn't she said helena sighed and walked down the platform her heart was beating thickly she could hardly breathe the station lamps hung low so they made a ceiling of heat and dusty light she suffocated under them for a moment she beat with hysteria feeling as most of us feel when sick on a hot summer night as if she must certainly go crazed smothered under the grey woolly blanket of heat siegmund was late it was already twenty-five minutes past ten she went towards the booking office at that moment siegmund came on to the platform here i am he said where is louisa helena pointed to the seat without answering she was looking at siegmund he was distracted by the excitement of the moment so she could not read him olive is there too she explained siegmund stood still straining his eyes to see the two women seated amidst pale wicker dress baskets and dark rugs the stranger made things more complex does she your other friend does she know he asked she knows nothing replied helena in a low tone as she led him forward to be introduced how do you do replied olive in most mellow contralto behold the dauntless three with their traps you will see us forth on our perils i will since i may not do more replied siegmund smiling continuing and how is sister louisa she is very well thank you it is her turn now cried louisa vindictive triumphant there was always a faint animosity in her bearing towards siegmund he understood and smiled at her enmity for the two were really good friends it is your turn now he repeated smiling and he turned away he and helena walked down the platform how did you find things at home he asked her oh as usual she replied indifferently and you just the same he answered he thought for a moment or two then added the children are happier without me oh you mustn't say that kind of thing protested helena miserably it's not true it's all right dear he answered so long as they are happy it's all right after a pause he added but i feel pretty bad tonight helena's hand tightened on his arm he had reached the end of the platform there he stood looking up the line which ran dark under a haze of lights the high red signal lamps hung aloft in a scarlet swarm farther off like spangles shaking downwards from a burst skyrocket was a tangle of brilliant red and green signal lamps settling a train with the warm flare on its thick column of smoke came thundering upon the lovers dazed they felt the yellow bar of carriage windows brush in vibration across their faces the ground and the air rocked then siegmund turned his head to watch the red and the green lights in the rear of the train swiftly dwindle on the darkness still watching the distance where the train had vanished he said dear i want you to promise that whatever happens to me you will go on remember to 
Remember, dear, two wrongs don't make a right. Helena swiftly, with a movement of terror, faced him, looking into his eyes. But he was in the shadow, she could not see him. The flat sound of his voice, lacking resonance, the dead expressionless tone, made her lose her presence of mind. She stared at him blankly. What do you mean? What has happened? Something has happened to you. What has happened at home? What are you going to do? She said sharply. She palpitated with terror. For the first time she felt powerless. Siegmund was beyond her grasp. She was afraid of him. He had shaken away her hold over him. There's nothing fresh the matter at home, he replied wearily. He was to be scourged with emotion again. I swear it, he added, and I have not made up my mind, but I can't think of life without you, and life must go on. And I swear, she said wrathfully, turning at bay, that I won't live a day after you. Siegmund dropped his head. The dead spring of his emotion swelled up, scalding hot again. Then he said, almost inaudibly, Ah, oh, don't speak to me like that, dear. It is late to be angry. When I have seen your train out tonight, there is nothing left. Helena looked at him, dumb with dismay, stupid, angry. They became aware of the porters shouting loudly that the Waterloo train was to leave from another platform. "'You'd better come,' said Siegmund, and they hurried down towards Louisa and Olive. "'We've got to change platforms,' cried Louisa, running forward and excitedly announcing the news. "'Yes,' replied Helena, pale and impassive. Siegmund picked up the luggage. "'I say,' cried Olive, rushing to catch Helena and Louisa by the arm, "'look, look, both of you, look at that hat!' A lady in front was wearing on her hat a wild and dishevelled array of peacock feathers. "'It's the sight of a lifetime. I wouldn't have you miss it.' added Olive in hoarse sotto voce. "'Indeed not!' cried Helena, turning in wild exasperation to look. "'Get a good view of it, Olive. Let's have a good mental impression of it, one that will last.' "'That's right, dear,' said Olive, somewhat nonplussed by this outburst. Siegmund had escaped with the heaviest two bags. They could see him ahead climbing the steps. Olive readjusted herself from the wildly animated to the calmly ironical. "'After all, dear,' she said, as they hurried in the tail of the crowd, "'it's not half a bad idea to get a man on the job.' Louisa laughed aloud at this vulgar conception of Siegmund. "'Just now, at any rate,' she rejoined. As they reached the platform, the train ran in before them. Helena watched anxiously for an empty carriage. There was not one. "'Perhaps it is as well,' she thought. "'We needn't talk. There will be three quarters of an hour at Waterloo. If we were alone, Olive would make Siegmund talk. She found a carriage with four people, and hastily took possession. Siegmund followed her with the bags. He swung these on the rack, and then quickly received the rugs, umbrellas, and packages from the other two. These he put on the seats, or anywhere, while Helena stowed them. She was very busy for a moment or two. The racks were full. Other people entered. Their luggage was troublesome to bestow. 
when she turned round again she found louisa and olive seated but siegmund was outside on the platform and the door was closed he saw her face move as if she would cry to him she restrained herself and immediately called you are coming oh you are coming to waterloo he shook his head i cannot come he said she stood looking blankly at him for some moments unable to reach the door because of the portmanteau thrust through with umbrellas and sticks which stood on the floor between the knees of the passengers she was helpless siegmund was repeating deliriously in his mind oh go 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 when will she go he could not bear her piteousness her presence made him feel insane would you like to come to the window a man asked of helena kindly she smiled suddenly in his direction without perceiving him he pulled the portmanteau under his legs and helena edged past she stood by the door leaning forward with some of her old protective grace her hawa spirit evident benign and shielding she bent forward looking at siegmund but her face was blank with helplessness with misery of helplessness she stood looking at siegmund saying nothing his forehead was scorched and swollen she noticed sorrowfully and beneath one eye the skin was blistered his eyes were bloodshot and glazed in a kind of apathy they filled her with terror he looked up at her because she wished it for himself he could not see her he could only recoil from her all he wished was to hide himself in the dark alone yet she wanted him and so far he yielded but to go to waterloo he could not yield the people in the carriage made uneasy by this strange farewell did not speak there were a few taut moments of silence no one seems to have strength to interrupt these spaces of irresolute anguish finally the guard's whistle went siegmund and helena clasped hands a warm flush of love and healthy grief came over siegmund for the last time the train began to move drawing helena's hand from his monday she whispered monday meaning that on monday she should receive a letter from him he nodded turned hesitated looked at her turned and walked away she remained at the window watching him depart now dear we are manless said olive in a whisper but her attempt at a joke fell dead everybody was silent and uneasy end of chapter 26 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Chapter twenty seven of The Trespasser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter twenty seven he hurried down the platform wincing at every stride from the memory of helena's last look of mute heavy yearning he gripped his fists till they trembled his thumbs were again closed under his fingers like a picture on a cloth before him he still saw helena's face white rounded in feature quite mute and expressionless just made terrible by the heavy eyes 
pleading dumbly he thought of her going on and on still at the carriage window looking out all through the night rushing west and west to the land of isolde things began to haunt siegmund like a delirium he knew not where he was hurrying always in front of him as on a cloth was the face of helena while somewhere behind the cloth was cornwall a far-off lonely place where darkness came on intensely sometimes he saw a dim small phantom in the darkness of cornwall very far off then the face of helena white inanimate as a mask with heavy eyes came between again he was almost startled to find himself at home in the porch of his house the door opened he remembered to have heard the quick thud of feet it was vera she glanced at him but said nothing instinctively she shrank from him he passed without noticing her she stood on the doormat fastening the door striving to find something to say to him you have been over an hour she said still more troubled when she found her voice shaking she had no idea what alarmed her ay returned siegmund he went into the dining-room and dropped into his chair with his head between his hands vera followed him nervously will you have anything to eat she asked he looked up at the table as if the supper laid there were curious and incomprehensible the delirious lifting of his eyelids showed the whole of the dark pupils and the bloodshot white of his eyes vera held her breath with fear he sank his head again and said nothing vera sat down and waited the minutes ticked slowly off siegmund neither moved nor spoke at last the clock struck midnight she was weary with sleep querulous with trouble aren't you going to bed she asked siegmund heard her without paying any attention he seemed only to half hear vera waited a while then repeated plaintively aren't you going to bed father siegmund lifted his head and looked at her he loathed the idea of having to move he looked at her confusedly yes i'm going he said and his head dropped again vera knew he was not asleep she dared not leave him till he was in his bedroom again she sat waiting father she cried at last he started up gripping the arms of his chair trembling yes i'm going he said he rose and went unevenly upstairs vera followed him close behind if he reels and falls backwards he will kill me she thought but he did not fall from habit he went into the bathroom while trying to brush his teeth he dropped the toothbrush onto the floor i'll pick it up in the morning he said continuing deliriously i must go to bed i must go to bed i am very tired he stumbled over the doormat into his own room vera was standing behind the unclosed door of her room she heard the sneck of his lock she heard the water still running in the bathroom trickling with the mysterious sound of water at dead of night screwing up her courage she went and turned off the tap then she stood again in her own room 
to be near the companionable breathing of her sleeping sister, listening. Siegmund undressed quickly. His one thought was to get into bed. One must sleep, he said, as he dropped his clothes on the floor. He could not find the way to put on his sleeping jacket, and that made him pant. Any little thing that roused or thwarted his mechanical action aggravated his sickness, till his brain seemed to be bursting. He got things right at last, and was in bed. Immediately he lapsed into a kind of unconsciousness. He would have called it sleep, but such it was not. All the time he could feel his brain working ceaselessly, like a machine running with unslackening rapidity. This went on, interrupted by little flickerings of consciousness, for three or four hours. Each time he had a glimmer of consciousness, he wondered if he made any noise. What am I doing? What is the matter? Am I unconscious? Do I make any noise? Do I disturb them? He wondered, and he tried to cast back to find the record of mechanical sense impression. He believed he could remember the sound of inarticulate murmuring in his throat. Immediately he remembered, he could feel his throat producing the sounds. This frightened him. Above all things, he was afraid of disturbing the family. He roused himself to listen. Everything was breathing in silence. As he listened to this silence, he relapsed into his sort of sleep. He was awakened finally by his own perspiration. He was terribly hot. The pillows, the bedclothes, his hair, all seemed to be steaming with hot vapour, while his body was bathed in sweat. It was coming light. Immediately he shut his eyes again and lay still. He was now conscious, and his brain was irritably active. But his body was a separate thing, a terrible, heavy, hot thing over which he had slight control. Siegmund lay still, with his eyes closed, enduring the exquisite torture of the trickling of drops of sweat. First it would be one, gathering and running its irregular, hesitating way into the hollow of his neck. His every nerve thrilled to it, yet he felt he could not move more than to stiffen his throat slightly. While yet the nerves in the track of this drop were quivering, raw with sensitiveness, another drop would start from off the side of his chest, and trickle downwards among the little muscles of his side, to drip onto the bed. It was like the running of a spider over his sensitive, moveless body. Why he did not wipe himself, he did not know. He lay still and endured this horrible tickling, which seemed to bite deep into him, rather than make the effort to move, which he loathed to do. The drops ran off his forehead down his temples. Those he did not mind, he was blunt there. But they started again in tiny vicious spurts down the sides of his chest, from under his armpits, down the inner sides of his thighs, till he seemed to have a myriad quivering tracks of a myriad running insects over his hot, wet, highly sensitised body. His nerves were trembling, one and all, with outrage and vivid suspense. It became unbearable. He felt that if he endured it another moment, he would cry out, or suffocate and burst. He sat up suddenly, 
threw away the bedclothes, from which came a puff of hot steam, and began to rub his pyjamas against his sides and his legs. He rubbed madly for a few moments. Then he sighed with relief. He sat on the side of the bed, moving from the hot dampness of the place where he had lain. For a moment he thought he would go to sleep. Then in an instant his brain seemed to click awake. He was still as loath as ever to move, but his brain was no longer clouded in hot vapour. It was clear. He sat bowing forward on the side of his bed, his sleeping jacket open, the dawn stealing into the room, the morning air entering fresh through the wide-flung window door. He felt a peculiar sense of guilt, of wrongness, in thus having jumped out of bed. It seemed to him as if he ought to have endured the heat of his body and the infernal trickling of the drops of sweat. But at the thought of it he moved his hands gratefully over his sides, which now were dry and soft and smooth, slightly chilled on the surface perhaps, for he felt a sudden tremor of shivering from the warm contact of his hands. Siegmund sat up straight. His body was reanimated. He felt the pillow and the groove where he had lain. It was quite wet and clammy. There was a scent of sweat on the bed, not really unpleasant, but he wanted something fresh and cool. Siegmund sat in the doorway that gave onto the small veranda. The air was beautifully cool. He felt his chest again, to make sure it was not clammy. It was as smooth as silk. This pleased him very much. He looked out on the night again, and was startled. Somewhere the moon was shining duskily in a hidden quarter of sky, but straight in front of him, in the northwest, silent lightning was fluttering. He waited breathlessly to see if it were true. Then again the pale lightning jumped up into the dome of the fading night. It was like a white bird stirring restlessly on its nest. The night was drenching thinner, greyer. The lightning, like a bird that should have flown before the arm of day, moved on its nest in the boughs of darkness, raised itself, flickered its pale wings rapidly, then sank again, loath to fly. Siegmund watched it with wonder and delight. The day was pushing aside the boughs of darkness, hunting. The poor moon would be caught when the net was flung. Siegmund went out on the balcony to look at it. There it was, like a poor white mouse, a half-moon crouching on the mound of its course. It would run nimbly over to the western slope, then it would be caught in the net, and the sun would laugh like a great yellow cat as it stalked behind, playing with its prey, flashing out its bright paws. The moon, before making its last run, lay crouched, palpitating. The sun crept forth, laughing to itself as it saw its prey could not escape. The lightning, however, leaped low off the nest, like a bird decided to go, and flew away. Siegmund no longer saw it opening and shutting its wings in hesitation amid the disturbance of the dawn. Instead there came a flush, the white lightning gone, the brief pink butterflies of sunrise and sunset rose up from the mown fields of darkness and fluttered low in a cloud. Even in the west they flew in a narrow rosy swarm, 
they separated thinned rising higher some flying up became golden some flew rosy gold across the moon the mouse moon motionless with fear soon the pink butterflies had gone leaving a scarlet stretch like a field of poppies in the fens as a wind the light of day blew in from the east puff after puff filling with whiteness the space which had been the night siegmund sat watching the last morning blowing in across the mown darkness till the whole field of the world was exposed till the moon was like a dead mouse which floats on water when the few birds had called in the august morning when the cocks had finished their crowing when the minute sounds of the early day were astir siegmund shivered disconsolate he felt tired again yet he knew he could not sleep the bed was repulsive to him he sat in his chair at the open door moving uneasily what should have been sleep was an ache and a restlessness he turned and twisted in his chair where is helena he asked himself and he looked out on the morning everything out of doors was unreal like a show like a peep show helena was an actress somewhere in the brightness of this view he alone was out of the piece he sighed petulantly pressing back his shoulders as if they ached his arms too ached with irritation while his head seemed to be hissing with angry irritability for a long time he sat with clenched teeth merely holding himself in check in his present state of irritability everything that occurred to his mind stirred him with dislike or disgust helena music the pleasant company of friends the sunshine of the country each as it offered itself to his thoughts was met by an angry contempt was rejected scornfully as nothing could please or distract him the only thing that remained was to support the discord he felt as if he were a limb out of joint from the body of life there occurred to his imagination a disjointed finger swollen and discoloured racked with pains the question was how should he reset himself into joint the body of life for him meant beatrice his children helena the comic opera his friends of the orchestra how could he set himself again into joint with these it was impossible towards his family he would henceforward have to bear himself with humility that was a cynicism he would have to leave helena which he could not do he would have to play strenuously night after night the music of the saucy little switzer which was absurd in fine it was all absurd and impossible very well then that being so what remained possible why to depart if thine hand offend thee cut it off he could cut himself off from life it was plain and straightforward but beatrice his young children without him he was bound by an agreement which there was no discrediting to provide for them very well he must provide for them and then what humiliation at home helena forsaken musical comedy night after night that was insufferable impossible 
like a man tangled up in a rope he was not strong enough to free himself he could not break with helena and return to a degrading life at home he could not leave his children and go to helena very well it was impossible then there remained only one door which he could open in this prison corridor of life siegmund looked round the room he could get his razor or he could hang himself he had thought of the two ways before yet now he was unprovided his portmanteau stood at the foot of the bed its straps flung loose a portmanteau strap would do then it should be a portmanteau strap very well said siegmund it is finally settled i had better write to helena and tell her and say to her she must go on i'd better tell her he sat for a long time with his notebook and a pencil but he wrote nothing at last he gave up perhaps it is just as well he said to himself she said she would come with me perhaps that is just as well she will go to the sea when she knows the sea will take her she must know he took a card bearing her name and her cornwall address from his pocket-book and laid it on the dressing-table she will come with me he said to himself and his heart rose with elation that is a cowardice he added looking doubtfully at the card as if wondering whether to destroy it it is in the hands of god beatrice may or may not send word to her at tintagel it is in the hands of god he concluded then he sat down again but for that fear of something after death he quoted to himself it is not fear he said the act itself will be horrible and fearsome but the after death it's no more than struggling awake when you're sick with a fright of dreams we are such stuff as dreams are made on siegmund sat thinking of the after death which to him seemed so wonderfully comforting full of rest and reassurance and renewal he experienced no mystical ecstasies he was sure of a wonderful kindness in death a kindness which really reached right through life though here he could not avail himself of it siegmund had always inwardly held faith that the heart of life beat kindly towards him when he was cynical and sulky he knew that in reality it was only a waywardness of his the heart of life is implacable in its kindness it may not be moved to fluttering of pity it swings on uninterrupted by cries of anguish or of hate siegmund was thankful for this unfaltering sternness of life there was no futile hesitation between doom and pity therefore he could submit and have faith if each man by his crying could swerve the slow sheer universe what a doom of guilt he might gain if life could swerve from its orbit for pity what terror of vacillation and who would wish to bear the responsibility of the deflection siegmund thank god that life was pitiless strong enough to take his treasures out of his hands and to thrust him out of the room otherwise how could he go with any faith to death otherwise 
he would have felt the helpless disillusion of a youth who finds his infallible parents weaker than himself i know the heart of life is kind said siegmund because i feel it otherwise i would live in defiance but life is greater than me or anybody we suffer and we don't know why often life doesn't explain but i can keep faith in it as a dog has faith in his master after all life is as kind to me as i am to my dog i have proportionately as much zest and my purpose towards my dog is good i need not despair of life it occurred to siegmund that he was meriting the old gibe of the atheists he was shirking the responsibility of himself turning it over to an imaginary god well he said i can't help it i do not feel altogether self-responsible the morning had waxed during these investigations siegmund had been vaguely aware of the rousing of the house he was finally startled into a consciousness of the immediate present by the calling of vera at his door there are two letters for you father he looked about him in bewilderment the hours had passed in a trance and he had no idea of his time and place oh all right he said too much dazed to know what it meant he heard his daughter going downstairs then swiftly returned over him the throbbing ache of his head and his arms the discordant jarring of his body what made her bring me the letters he asked himself it was a very unusual attention his heart replied very sullen and shameful she wanted to know she wanted to make sure i was all right siegmund forgot all his speculations on a divine benevolence the discord of his immediate situation overcame every harmony he did not fetch in the letters is it so late he said is there no more time for me he went to look at his watch it was a quarter to nine as he walked across the room he trembled and a sickness made his bones feel rotten he sat down on the bed what am i going to do he asked himself by this time he was shuddering rapidly a peculiar feeling as if his belly were turned into nothingness made him want to press his fists into his abdomen he remained shuddering drunkenly like a drunken man who is sick incapable of thought or action a second knock came at the door he started with a jolt here is your shaving water said beatrice in cold tones it's half past nine all right said siegmund rising from the bed bewildered and what time shall you expect dinner asked beatrice she was still contemptuous any time i'm not going out he answered he was surprised to hear the ordinary cool tone of his own voice for he was shuddering uncontrollably and was almost sobbing in a shaking, bewildered, disordered condition, he set about fulfilling his purpose. He was hardly conscious of anything he did. Try as he would, he could not keep his hands steady in the violent spasms of shuddering, nor could he call his mind to think. He was one shuddering turmoil. Yet he performed his purpose methodically 
and exactly in every particular he was thorough as if he were the servant of some stern will it was a mesmeric performance in which the agent trembled with convulsive sickness End of chapter 27 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 28 of The Trespasser This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson the trespasser by d h lawrence chapter twenty eight siegmund's lying late in bed made beatrice very angry the later it became the more wrathful she grew at half-past nine she had taken up his shaving water then she proceeded to tidy the dining-room leaving the breakfast spread in the kitchen vera and frank were gone up to town they would both be home for dinner at two o'clock marjorie was dispatched on an errand taking gwen with her the children had no need to return home immediately therefore it was highly probable they would play in the field or in the lane for an hour or two Beatrice was alone downstairs. It was a hot, still morning, when everything out of doors shone brightly, and all indoors was dusked with coolness and colour. But Beatrice was angry. She moved rapidly and determinedly about the dining-room, thrusting old newspapers and magazines between the cupboard and the wall, throwing the litter in the grate, which was clear, Friday having been charwoman's day, passing swiftly, lightly over the front of the furniture with the duster. It was Saturday, when she did not spend much time over the work. In the afternoon she was going out with Vera. That was not, however, what occupied her mind as she brushed aside her work she had determined to have a settlement with siegmund as to how matters should continue she was going to have no more of the past three years life things had come to a crisis and there must be an alteration beatrice was going to do battle therefore she flew at her work thus stirring herself up to a proper heat of blood all the time, as she thrust things out of sight, or straightened a cover, she listened for Siegmund to come downstairs. He did not come, so her anger waxed. "'He can lie skulking in bed,' she said to herself. "'Here I've been up since seven, broiling at it. I should think he's pitying himself.' He ought to have something else to do. He ought to have to go out to work every morning, like another man, as his son has to do. He has had too little work. He has had too much his own way. But it's come to a stop now. I'll servant housekeeper him no longer. Beatrice went to clean the step of the front door. She clanged the bucket loudly every minute becoming more and more angry that piece of work finished she went into the kitchen it was twenty past ten her wrath was at ignition point she cleared all the things from the table and washed them up as she was so doing her anger having reached full intensity without bursting into flame began to dissipate in uneasiness she tried to imagine what Siegmund would do and say to her. As she was wiping a cup, she dropped it, and the smash so unnerved her that her hands trembled almost too much to finish drying the things 
and putting them away. At last it was done. Her next piece of work was to make the beds. She took her pail and went upstairs. Her heart was beating so heavily in her throat that she had to stop on the landing to recover her breath. She dreaded the combat with him. Suddenly controlling herself, she said loudly at Siegmund's door, her voice coldly hostile, "'Aren't you going to get up?' There was not the faintest sound in the house. Beatrice stood in the gloom of the landing, her heart thudding in her ears. "'It's after half-past ten. Aren't you going to get up?' she called. She waited again. Two letters lay unopened on a small table. Suddenly she put down her pail and went into the bathroom. The pot of shaving water stood untouched on the shelf, just as she had left it. She returned and knocked swiftly at her husband's door, not speaking. She waited. Then she knocked again, loudly, a long time. Something in the sound of her knocking made her afraid to try again. The noise was dull and thudding. It did not resound through the house with a natural ring, so she thought. She ran downstairs in terror, fled out into the front garden, and there looked up at his room. The window door was open. Everything seemed quiet. Beatrice stood vacillating. She picked up a few tiny pebbles and flung them in a handful at his door. Some spattered on the panes sharply. Some dropped dully in the room. One clinked on the wash-hand bowl. There was no response. Beatrice was terribly excited. She ran, with her black eyes blazing, and wisps of her black hair flying about her thin temples, out on to the road. By a mercy she saw the window-cleaner, just pushing his ladder out of the passage of a house, a little farther down the road. She hurried to him. "'Will you come and see if there's anything wrong with my husband?' she asked wildly. "'Why, ma'am?' asked the window-cleaner, who knew her, and was humbly familiar. "'Is he taken bad or something? Yes, I'll come.' He was a tall, thin man with a brown beard. His clothes were all so loose, his trousers so baggy, that he gave one the impression his limbs must be bone, and his body a skeleton. He pushed at his ladders with a will. "'Where is he, Mum?' he asked officiously, as they slowed down at the side passage. "'He's in his bedroom, and I can't get an answer from him.' "'Then I shall want a ladder,' said the window-cleaner, proceeding to lift one off his trolley. He was in a very great bustle. He knew which was Siegmund's room. He had often seen Siegmund rise from some music he was studying, and leave the drawing-room when the window-cleaning began, and afterwards he had found him in the small front bedroom. He also knew there were matrimonial troubles. Beatrice was not reserved. "'Is it the least of the front rooms he's in?' asked the window-cleaner. "'Yes, over the porch,' replied Beatrice. The man bustled with his ladder. "'It's easy enough,' he said. "'The door's open, and we're soon on the balcony.' He set the ladder securely. Beatrice cursed him for a slow, officious fool. He tested the ladder to see it was safe. Then he cautiously clambered up. At the top he stood leaning sideways, bending over the ladder to peer into the room. He could see all sorts of things, for he was frightened. "'I say there!' he called loudly. Beatrice stood below in horrible suspense. "'Go in!' she cried. 
go in is he there the man stepped very cautiously with one foot on to the balcony and peered forward but the glass door reflected into his eyes he followed slowly with the other foot and crept forward ready at any moment to take flight ay ay he suddenly cried in terror and he drew back beatrice was opening her mouth to scream when the window cleaner exclaimed weakly as if dubious i believe he's hanged himself from the door hooks no cried beatrice no 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 i believe he has repeated the man go in and see if he's dead cried beatrice the man remained in the doorway peering fixedly i believe he is he said doubtfully no go and see screamed beatrice the man went into the room trembling hesitating he approached the body as if fascinated shivering he took it round the loins and tried to lift it down it was too heavy i know he said to himself once more bustling now he had something to do he took his clasp knife from his pocket jammed the body between himself and the door so that it should not drop and began to saw his way through the leathern strap it gave he started and clutched the body dropping his knife beatrice below in the garden hearing the scuffle and the clatter began to scream in hysteria the man hauled the body of siegmund with much difficulty on to the bed and with trembling fingers tried to unloose the buckle in which the strap ran it was bedded in siegmund's neck the window cleaner tugged at it frantically till he got it loose then he looked at siegmund the dead man lay on the bed with swollen discoloured face with his sleeping jacket pushed up in a bunch under his armpits leaving his side naked beatrice was screaming below the window cleaner quite unnerved ran from the room and scrambled down the ladder siegmund lay heaped on the bed his sleeping suit twisted and bunched up about him his face hardly recognizable End of chapter 28 Recording by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 29 of The Trespasser This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 29 Helena was dozing down in the cove at Tintagel. She and Louisa and Olive lay on the cool sands in the shadow and steeped themselves in rest in a cool sea-fragrant tranquillity the journey down had been very tedious after waiting for half an hour in the midnight turmoil of an august friday in waterloo station they had seized an empty carriage only to be followed by five north countrymen all of whom were affected by whisky olive helena louisa occupied three corners of the carriage the men were distributed between them the three women were not alarmed their tipsy travelling companions promised to be tiresome but they had a frank honesty of manner that placed them beyond suspicion the train drew out westward Helena began to count the miles that separated her from Siegmund. 
the north countrymen began to be jolly they talked loudly in their uncouth english they sang the musical songs of the day they furtively drank whisky through all this they were polite to the girls as much could hardly be said in return of olive and louisa they leaned forward whispering to one another they sat back in their seats laughing hiding their laughter by turning their backs on the men who were a trifle disconcerted by this amusement the train spun on and on little homely clusters of lamps suggesting the quiet of country life turned slowly round through the darkness the men dropped into a doze olive put a handkerchief over her face and went to sleep louisa gradually nodded and jerked into slumber helena sat weariedly and watched the rolling of the sleeping travellers and the dull blank of the night shearing off outside neither the men nor the women looked well asleep they lurched and nodded stupidly she thought of bazarov in fathers and sons endorsing his opinion on the appearance of sleepers all but siegmund was siegmund asleep she imagined him breathing regularly on the pillows she could see the under arch of his eyebrows the fine shape of his nostrils the curve of his lips as she bent in fancy over his face the dawn came slowly it was rather cold olive wrapped herself in rugs and went to sleep again helena shivered and stared out of the window there appeared a wanness in the night and helena felt inexpressibly dreary a rosiness spread out far away it was like a flock of flamingos hovering over a dark lake the world vibrated as the sun came up helena waked the tipsy men at exeter having heard them say that there they must change then she walked the platform very jaded the train rushed on again it was a most most wearisome journey the fields were very flowery the morning was very bright but what were these to her she wanted dimness sleep forgetfulness at eight o'clock breakfast time the dauntless three were driving in a wagonette amid blazing breathless sunshine over country naked of shelter ungracious and harsh why am i doing this helena asked herself the three friends washed dressed and breakfasted it was too hot to rest in the house so they trudged to the coast silently each feeling in an ill humour when helena was really rested she took great pleasure in tintagel in the first place she found that the cove was exactly almost identically the same as the valhalla seen in valkyra in the second place tristan was here in the tragic country filled with the flowers of a late cornish summer an everlasting reality in the third place it was a sea of marvellous portentous sunsets of sweet morning baths of pools blossomed with life of terrible suave swishing of foam which suggested the anadyomene in sum it was the enchanted land of divided lovers helena forever hummed fragments of tristan as she stood on the rocks she sang in her little half-articulate way bits of isolde's love bits of tristan's anguish to siegmund 
she had not received her letter on Sunday. That had not very much disquieted her, though she was disappointed. On Monday she was miserable because of Siegmund's silence, but there was so much of enchantment in Tintagel, and Olive and Louisa were in such high spirits that she forgot most whiles. On Monday night, towards two o'clock, there came a violent storm of thunder and lightning. Louisa started up in bed at the first clap, waking Helena. The room palpitated with white light for two seconds. The mirror on the dressing-table glared supernaturally. Louisa clutched her friend. All was dark again, the thunder clapping directly. "'There! Wasn't that lovely!' cried Louisa, speaking of the lightning. "'Oh, wasn't it magnificent! Glorious!' The door clicked and opened. Olive entered in her long white nightgown. She hurried to the bed. "'I say, dear,' she exclaimed, "'may I come into the fold? I prefer the shelter of your company, dear, during this little lot.' "'Don't you like it?' cried Louisa. "'I think it's lovely, lovely!' There came another slash of lightning. The night seemed to open and shut. It was a pallid vision of a ghost world between the clanging shutters of darkness. Louisa and Olive clung to each other spasmodically. There! exclaimed the former, breathless. That was fine! Helena, did you see that? She clasped ecstatically the hand of her friend, who was lying down. Helena's answer was extinguished by the burst of thunder. "'There's no accounting for tastes,' said Olive, taking a place in the bed. "'I can't say I'm struck on lightning. What about you, Helena?' "'I'm not struck yet,' replied Helena, with a sarcastic attempt at a jest. "'Thank you, dear.' said Olive, you do me the honour of catching hold. Helena laughed ironically. Catching what? asked Louisa, mystified. Why, dear, answered Olive, heavily condescending to explain, I offered Helena the handle of a pun, and she took it. What a flash! You know it's not that I'm afraid. The rest of her speech was overwhelmed in thunder. Helena lay on the edge of the bed, listening to the ecstatics of one friend and to the impertinences of the other. In spite of her ironical feeling, the thunder impressed her with a sense of fatality. The night opened, revealing a ghostly landscape, instantly to shut again with blackness. Then the thunder crashed. Helena felt as if some secret were being disclosed too swiftly and violently for her to understand. The thunder exclaimed horribly on the matter. She was sure something had happened. Gradually the storm drew away. The rain came down with a rush persisted with a bruising sound upon the earth and the leaves. "'What a deluge!' exclaimed Louisa. No one answered her. Olive was falling asleep, and Helena was in no mood to reply. Louisa, disconsolate, lay looking at the black window, nursing a grievance until she too drifted into sleep. Helena was awake. The storm had left her with a settled sense of calamity. She felt bruised. The sound of the heavy rain bruising the ground outside represented her feeling. She could not get rid of the bruised sense of disaster. She lay wondering what it was, why Siegmund had not written, 
what could have happened to him she imagined all of them terrible and endued with grandeur for she had kinship with hedda gabler but no she said to herself it is impossible anything should have happened to him i should have known i should have known the moment his spirit left his body he would have come to me but i slept without dreams last night and to-day i am sure there has been no crisis it is impossible it should have happened to him i should have known she was very certain that in event of siegmund's death she would have received intelligence she began to consider all the causes which might arise to prevent his writing immediately to her nevertheless she said at last if i don't hear to-morrow i will go and see she had written to him on monday if she should receive no answer by wednesday morning she would return to london as she was deciding this she went to sleep the next day passed without news helena was in a state of distress her wistfulness touched the other two women very keenly louisa waited upon her was very tender and solicitous olive who was becoming painful by reason of her unsatisfied curiosity had to be told in part of the state of affairs helena looked up a train she was quite sure by this time that something fatal awaited her the next morning she bade her friends a temporary good-bye, saying she would return in the evening. Immediately the train had gone, Louisa rushed into the little waiting-room of the station and wept. Olive shed tears for sympathy and self-pity. She pitied herself that she should be let in for so dismal a holiday louisa suddenly stopped crying and sat up i know i'm a pig dear am i not she exclaimed spoiling your holiday but i couldn't help it dear indeed i could not my dear lou cried olive in tragic contralto don't refrain for my sake the bargain's made we can't help what's in the bundle the two unhappy women trudged the long miles back from the station to their lodging. Helena sat in the swinging express revolving the same thought like a prayer wheel. It would be difficult to think of anything more trying than thus sitting motionless in the train, which itself is throbbing and bursting its heart with anxiety while one waits hour after hour for the blow which falls nearer as the distance lessens all the time helena's heart and her consciousness were with siegmund in london for she believed he was ill and needed her promise me she had said if ever i was sick and wanted you you would come to me i would come to you from hell siegmund had replied and if you were ill would you let me come to you she had added i promise he answered now helena believed he was ill perhaps very ill perhaps she only could be of any avail the miles of distance were like hot bars of iron across her breast and against them it was impossible to strive the train did what it could that day remains as a smear in the record of helena's life in it there is no spacing of hours no lettering of experience merely a smear of suspense towards six o'clock she alighted at surbiton station deciding that this would be the quickest way of getting to Wimbledon. She paced the platform slowly, as if resigned, but her heart was crying out at the great injustice of delay. Presently the local train came in. 
she had planned to buy a local paper at wimbledon and if from that source she could learn nothing she would go on to his house and inquire she had pre-arranged everything minutely after turning the newspaper several times she found what she sought the funeral took place at two o'clock today at kingston cemetery of deceased was a professor of music and had just returned from a holiday on the south coast the paragraph in a bald twelve lines told her everything jury returned a verdict of suicide during temporary insanity sympathy was expressed for the widow and children helena stood still on the station for some time looking at the print then she dropped the paper and wandered into the town not knowing where she was going that was what i got she said months afterwards and it was like a brick it was like a brick she wandered on and on until suddenly she found herself in the grassy lane with only a wire fence bounding her from the open fields on either side beyond which fields on the left she could see siegmund's house standing florid by the road catching the western sunlight then she stopped realizing where she had come for some time she stood looking at the house it was no use her going there it was of no use her going anywhere the whole wide world was opened but in it she had no destination there was no direction for her to take as if marooned in the world she stood desolate looking from the house of siegmund over the fields and the hills siegmund was gone why had he not taken her with him the evening was drawing on it was nearly half past seven when helena looked at her watch remembering louisa who would be waiting for her to return to cornwall i must either go to her or wire to her she will be in a fever of suspense said helena to herself and straightway she hurried to catch a tramcar to return to the station she arrived there at a quarter to eight there was no train down to tintagel that night therefore she wired the news siegmund dead no train to-night am going home this done she took her ticket and sat down to wait by the strength of her will everything she did was reasonable and accurate but her mind was chaotic it was like a brick she reiterated and that brutal simile was the only one she could find months afterwards to describe her condition she felt as if something had crashed into her brain stunning and maiming her as she knocked at the door of home she was apparently quite calm her mother opened to her what are you alone cried mrs verdon yes louisa did not come up replied helena passing into the dining-room as if by instinct she glanced on the mantelpiece to see if there was a letter there was a newspaper cutting she went forward and took it it was from one of the london papers inquest was held to-day upon the body of helena read it read it again folded it up and put it in her purse her mother stood watching her consumed with distress and anxiety how did you get to know she asked i went to wimbledon and bought a local paper replied the daughter in her muted toneless voice did you go to the house asked the mother sharply no replied helena i was wondering whether to send you that paper 
said her mother hesitatingly helena did not answer her she wandered about the house mechanically looking for something her mother followed her trying very gently to help her for some time helena sat at table in the dining-room staring before her her parents moved restlessly in silence trying not to irritate her by watching her praying for something to change the fixity of her look they acknowledged themselves helpless like children they felt powerless and forlorn and were very quiet won't you go to rest nelly asked the father at last he was an unobtrusive obscure man whose sympathy was very delicate whose ordinary attitude was one of gentle irony won't you go to rest nelly he repeated helena shivered slightly do my dear her mother pleaded let me take you to bed helena rose she had a great horror of being fussed or petted but this night she went dully upstairs and let her mother help her to undress when she was in bed the mother stood for some moments looking at her yearning to beseech her daughter to pray to god but she dared not helena moved with a wild impatience under her mother's gaze shall i leave you the candle said mrs verdon no blow it out replied the daughter the mother did so and immediately left the room going downstairs to her husband as she entered the dining-room he glanced up timidly at her she was a tall erect woman her brown eyes usually so swift and searching were haggard with tears that did not fall he bowed down obliterating himself his hands were tightly clasped will she be all right if you leave her he asked we must listen replied the mother abruptly the parents sat silent in their customary places presently mrs verdon cleared the supper-table sweeping together a few crumbs from the floor in the place where helena had sat carefully putting her pieces of broken bread under the loaf to keep moist then she sat down again one could see she was keenly alert to every sound the father had his hand to his head he was thinking and praying mrs verdon suddenly rose took a box of matches from the mantelpiece and hurrying her stately heavy tread went upstairs her husband followed in much trepidation hovering near the door of his daughter's room the mother tremblingly lit the candle helena's aspect distressed and alarmed her the girl's face was masked as if in sleep but occasionally it was crossed by a vivid expression of fear or horror her wide eyes showed the active insanity of her brain from time to time she uttered strange inarticulate sounds her mother held her hands and soothed her although she was hardly aware of the mother's presence helena was more tranquil the father went downstairs and turned out the light he brought his wife a large shawl which he put on the bed-rail and silently left the room then he went and kneeled down by his own bedside and prayed mrs verdon watched her daughter's delirium and all the time in a kind of mental chant invoked the help of god once or twice the girl came to herself drew away her hand on recognizing the situation and turned from her mother who patiently waited until upon relapse she could soothe her daughter again helena was glad of her mother's presence but she could not 
bear to be looked at towards morning the girl fell naturally asleep the mother regarded her closely lightly touched her forehead with her lips and went away having blown out the candle she found her husband kneeling in his nightshirt by the bed he muttered a few swift syllables and looked up as she entered she is asleep whispered the wife hoarsely is it a, a natural sleep hesitated the husband yes i think it is i think she will be all right thank god whispered the father almost inaudibly he held his wife's hand as she lay by his side he was the comforter she felt as if now she might cry and take comfort and sleep he the quiet obliterated man held her hand taking the responsibility upon himself end of chapter 29 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter Thirty of the Trespasser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Trespasser, by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Thirty. Beatrice was careful not to let the blow of Siegmund's death fall with full impact upon her. As it were she dodged it she was afraid to meet the accusation of the dead siegmund with the sacred jury of memories when the event summoned her to stand before the bench of her own soul's understanding she fled leaving the verdict upon herself eternally suspended when the neighbours had come alarmed by her screaming she had allowed herself to be taken away from her own house into the home of a neighbour there the children were brought to her there she wept and stared wildly about as if by instinct seeking to cover her mind with confusion the good neighbour controlled matters in siegmund's house sending for the police helping to lay out the dead body before vera and frank came home and before beatrice returned to her own place the bedroom of siegmund was locked beatrice avoided seeing the body of her husband she gave him one swift glance blinded by excitement she never saw him after his death she was equally careful to avoid thinking of him whenever her thoughts wandered towards a consideration of how he must have felt what his inner life must have been during the past six years she felt herself dilate with terror and she hastened to invoke protection the children she said to herself the children i must live for the children i must think for the children this she did and with much success all her tears and her wildness rose from terror and dismay rather than from grief she managed to fend back a grief that would probably have broken her vera was too practical-minded she had too severe a notion of what ought to be and what ought not ever to put herself in her father's place and try to understand him she concerned herself with judging him sorrowfully exonerating him in part because helena that other was so much more to blame frank as a sentimentalist wept over the situation not over the personae the children were acutely distressed by the harassing behaviour of the elders 
and longed for a restoration of equanimity by common consent no word was spoken of siegmund as soon as possible after the funeral beatrice moved from south london to harrow the memory of siegmund began to fade rapidly beatrice had had all her life a fancy for a more open public form of living than that of a domestic circle she liked strangers about the house they stimulated her agreeably therefore nine months after the death of her husband she determined to carry out the scheme of her heart and take in boarders she came of a well-to-do family with whom she had been in disgrace owing to her early romantic but degrading marriage with a young lad who had neither income nor profession in the tragic but also sordid event of his death the waltons returned again to the aid of beatrice they came hesitatingly and kept their gloves on they inquired what she intended to do she spoke highly and hopefully of her future boarding-house they found her a couple of hundred pounds glad to salve their consciences so cheaply siegmund's father a winsome old man with a heart of young gold was always ready further to diminish his diminished income for the sake of his grandchildren so beatrice was set up in a fairly large house in highgate was equipped with two maids and gentlemen were invited to come and board in her house it was a huge adventure wherein beatrice was delighted vera was excited and interested frank was excited but doubtful and grudging the children were excited elated wondering the world was big with promise three gentlemen came before a month was out to beatrice's establishment she hoped shortly to get a fourth or a fifth her plan was to play hostess and thus bestow on her boarders the inestimable blessing of family life breakfast was at eight thirty and every one attended vera sat opposite beatrice frank sat on the maternal right hand mr mcwhirter who was superior sat on the left hand next him sat mr allport whose opposite was mr holiday all were young men of less than thirty years mr mcwhirter was tall fair and stoutish he was very quietly spoken was humorous and amiable yet extraordinarily learned he never by any chance gave himself away maintaining always an absolute reserve amid all his amiability therefore frank would have done anything to win his esteem while beatrice was deferential to him mr allport was tall and broad and thin as a door he had also a remarkably small chin he was naive inclined to suffer in the first pangs of disillusionment nevertheless he was waywardly humorous sometimes wistful sometimes petulant always gallant therefore vera liked him whilst beatrice mothered him mr holiday was short very stout very ruddy with black hair he had a disagreeable voice was vulgar in the grain but officiously helpful if appeal were made to him therefore frank hated him vera liked his handsome lusty appearance but resented bitterly his behaviour beatrice was proud of the superior and skilful way in which she handled him clipping him into shape without hurting him one evening in july eleven months after the burial of siegmund 
Beatrice went into the dining-room and found Mr. Allport sitting with his elbow on the window-sill, looking out on the garden. It was half-past seven. The red rents between the foliage of the trees showed the sun was setting. A fragrance of evening-scented stocks filtered into the room through the open window. Towards the south, the moon was budding out of the twilight. "'What, you here all alone?' exclaimed Beatrice, who had just come from putting the children to bed. "'I thought you had gone out.' "'No, what's the use?' replied Mr. Allport, turning to look at his landlady. "'Of going out, there's nowhere to go.' "'Oh, come, there's the heath and the city, and you must join a tennis club. Now I know just the thing, the club to which Vera belongs.' "'Ah, yes, you go down to the city, but there's nothing there. What I mean to say, you want a pal and even then well he drawled the word well it's merely escaping from yourself killing time oh don't say that exclaimed beatrice you want to enjoy life just so ah just so exclaimed mr allport but all the same it's like this you only get up to the same thing to-morrow what i mean to say what's the good after all it's merely living because you've got to you are too pessimistic altogether for a young man i look at it differently myself yet i'll be bound i have more cause for grumbling what's the trouble now well you can't lay your finger on a thing like that what i mean to say it's nothing very definite but after all what is there to do but to hop out of life as quickly as possible that's the best way beatrice became suddenly grave you talk in that way mr allport she said you don't think of the others i don't know he drawled what does it matter look here who'd care what i mean to say for long that's all very easy but it's cowardly replied beatrice gravely nevertheless said mr allport it's true isn't it it is not and i should know replied beatrice drawing a cloak of reserve ostentatiously over her face. Mr. Allport looked at her and waited. Beatrice relaxed towards the pessimistic young man. "'Yes,' she said, "'I call it very cowardly to want to get out of your difficulties in that way. Think what you inflict on other people. You men, you're all selfish.' The burden is always left for the women. Ah, but then, said Mr. Allport, very softly and sympathetically, looking at Beatrice's black dress, I've no one depending on me. No, you haven't, but you've a mother and sister. The women always have to bear the brunt. Mr. Allport looked at Beatrice and found her very pathetic yes they do rather he replied sadly tentatively waiting my husband began beatrice the young man waited my husband was one of your sort he ran after trouble and when he'd found it he couldn't carry it off and left it to me Mr. Allport looked at her very sympathetically. "'You don't mean it!' he exclaimed softly. "'Surely he didn't—' Beatrice nodded, and turned aside her face. "'Yes,' she said. "'I know what it is to bear that kind of thing, and it's no light thing, I can assure you.' There was a suspicion of tears in her voice. "'And when was this, then, that he—' 
asked mr allport almost with reverence only last year replied beatrice mr allport made a sound expressing astonishment and dismay little by little beatrice told him so much her husband had got entangled with another woman she herself had put up with it for a long time at last she had brought matters to a crisis declaring what she should do he had killed himself hanged himself and left her penniless her people who were very wealthy had done for her as much as she would allow them she and frank and vera had done the rest she did not mind for herself it was for frank and vera who should be now enjoying their careless youth that her heart was heavy there was silence for a while mr allport murmured his sympathy and sat overwhelmed with respect for this little woman who was unbroken by tragedy the bell rang in the kitchen vera entered oh what a nice smell sitting in the dark mother i was just trying to cheer up mr allport he is very despondent pray do not overlook me said mr allport rising and bowing well i did not see you fancy your sitting in the twilight chatting with the mater you must have been an unscrupulous bore maman on the contrary replied mr allport mrs mcnair has been so good as to bear with me making a fool of myself in what way asked vera sharply mr allport is so despondent i think he must be in love said beatrice playfully unfortunately i am not or at least i'm not yet aware of it said mr allport bowing slightly to vera she advanced and stood in the bay of the window her skirt touching the young man's knees she was tall and graceful with her hands clasped behind her back she stood looking up at the moon now white upon the richly darkening sky don't look at the moon miss mcnair it's all rind said mr allport in melancholy mockery somebody's bitten all the meat out of our slice of moon and left us nothing but peel it certainly does look like a piece of melon shell one portion replied vera never mind miss mcnair he said whoever got the slice found it raw i think oh i don't know she said but isn't it a beautiful evening i will just go and see if i can catch the primroses opening what primroses he exclaimed evening primroses there are some are there he said in surprise vera smiled to herself yes come and look she said the young man rose with alacrity mr holliday came into the dining-room whilst they were down the garden what nobody in they heard him exclaim there is holiday murmured mr allport resentfully vera did not answer holiday came to the open window attracted by the fragrance oh that's where you are he cried in his nasal tenor which annoyed vera's trained ear she wished she had not been wearing a white dress to betray herself what have you got he asked nothing in particular replied mr allport mr holliday sniggered oh well if it's nothing particular and private said mr holliday and with that he leaped over the window-sill and went to join them cursed fool muttered mr allport i beg your pardon he added swiftly to vera have you ever noticed mr holliday asked vera as if very friendly how awfully tantalizing these flowers are they won't open while you're looking no 
sniggered he i don't blame em why should they give themselves away any more than you do you won't open while you're watched he nudged allport facetiously with his elbow after supper which was late and badly served the young men were in poor spirits mr mcwhirter retired to read mr holliday sat picking his teeth mr allport begged vera to play the piano oh the piano is not my instrument mine was the violin but i do not play now she replied but you will begin again pleaded mr allport no never she said decisively allport looked at her closely the family tragedy had something to do with her decision he was sure he watched her interestedly mother used to play she began vera said beatrice reproachfully let us have a song suggested mr holliday mr holliday wishes to sing mother said vera going to the music rack nay I, it's not me holliday began the village blacksmith said vera pulling out the piece holliday advanced vera glanced at her mother but i have not touched the piano for, for years i'm sure protested beatrice you can play beautifully said vera beatrice accompanied the song holliday sang atrociously allport glared at him vera remained very calm at the end beatrice was overcome by the touch of the piano she went out abruptly mother has suddenly remembered that tomorrow's jellies are not made laughed vera allport looked at her and was sad when beatrice returned holliday insisted she should play again she would have found it more difficult to refuse than to comply vera retired early soon to be followed by allport and holliday at half-past ten mr mcwhirter came in with his ancient volume beatrice was studying a cookery book you too at the midnight lamp exclaimed mr mcwhirter politely ah i am only looking for a pudding for to-morrow beatrice replied we shall feel hopelessly in debt if you look after us so well smiled the young man ironically i must look after you said beatrice you do wonderfully i feel that we owe you large debts of gratitude the meals were generally late and something was always wrong because i scan a list of puddings smiled beatrice uneasily for the puddings themselves and all your good things the piano for instance that was very nice indeed he bowed to her did it disturb you but one does not hear very well in the study i opened the door said mcwhirter bowing again it is not fair said beatrice i am clumsy now clumsy i once could play you play excellently why that once could said mcwhirter ah you are amiable my old master would have said differently she replied we said mcwhirter are humble amateurs and to us you are more than excellent good old monsieur fanier how he would scold me he said i would not take my talent out of the napkin he would quote me the new testament i always think scripture false in french do not you ah my acquaintance with modern languages is not extensive i regret to say no i was brought up at a convent school near rouen ah that would be very interesting yes but i was there six years and the interest wears off everything alas assented mcwhirter smiling 
those times were very different from these said beatrice i should think so said mcwhirter waxing grave and sympathetic end of chapter 30 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Chapter thirty one of the Trespasser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Trespasser by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter thirty one. In the same month of July, not yet a year after Siegmund's death. Helena sat on the top of the tramcar with Cecil Byrne. She was dressed in blue linen, for the day had been hot. Byrne was holding up to her a yellow-backed copy of Einsame Menschen, and she was humming the air of the Russian folk-song printed on the front page, frowning, nodding with her head and beating time with her hand to get the rhythm of the song. She turned suddenly to him and shook her head, laughing. I can't get it. It's no use. I think it's the swinging of the car prevents me getting the time, she said. These little outside things always come a victory over you, he laughed. Do they? she replied, smiling, bending her head against the wind. It was six o'clock in the evening. The sky was quite overcast, after a dim, warm day. The tramcar was leaping along southwards. Out of the corners of his eyes, Byrne watched the crisp morsels of hair shaken on her neck by the wind. "'Do you know,' she said, "'it feels rather like rain.' then said he calmly but turning away to watch the people below on the pavement you certainly ought not to be out i ought not she said for i'm totally unprovided neither however had the slightest intention of turning back presently they descended from the car and took a road leading uphill off the highway trees hung over one side whilst on the other side stood a few villas with lawns upraised upon one of these lawns two great sheep-dogs rushed and stood at the brink of the grassy declivity at some height above the road barking and urging boisterously helena and byrne stood still to watch them one dog was grey as is usual the other pale fawn they raved extravagantly at the two pedestrians helena laughed at them they are she began in her slow manner villa sheepdogs baying us wolves he continued no she said they remind me of fafner and fasolt fasolt they are like that i wonder if they really dislike us it appears so she laughed dogs generally chum up to me he said helena began suddenly to laugh he looked at her inquiringly i remember she said still laughing at knockholt you a half-grown lamb a dog in procession she marked the position of the three with her finger what an ass i must have looked he said sort of silent pied piper she laughed dogs do follow me like that though he said they did siegmund she said ah he exclaimed i remember they had for a long time a little brown dog that followed him home ah he exclaimed i remember too she said a little black and white kitten that followed me mater would not have it in she would not 
and i remember finding it a few days after dead in the road i don't think i ever quite forgave my mater that more sorrow over one kitten brought to destruction than over all the sufferings of men he said she glanced at him and laughed he was smiling ironically for the latter you see she replied i am not responsible as they neared the top of the hill a few spots of rain fell you know said helena if it begins it will continue all night look at that she pointed to the great dark reservoir of cloud ahead had we better go back he asked well we will go on and find a thick tree then we can shelter till we see how it turns out we are not far from the cars here they walked on and on the raindrops fell more thickly then thinned away it is exactly a year to-day she said as they walked on the round shoulder of the down with an oak wood on the left hand exactly what anniversary is it then he inquired exactly a year to-day siegmund and i walked here by the day thursday we went through the larch wood have you ever been through the larch wood no we will go then she said history repeats itself he remarked how she asked calmly he was pulling at the heads of the cocksfoot grass as he walked i see no repetition she added no he exclaimed bitingly you are right they went on in silence as they drew near a farm they saw the men unloading a last wagon of hay onto a very brown stack he sniffed the air though he was angry he spoke they got that hay rather damp he said can't you smell it like hot tobacco and sandalwood what is that the stack she asked yes it's always like that when it's picked damp the conversation was restarted but did not flourish when they turned on to a narrow path by the side of the field he went ahead leaning over the hedge he pulled three sprigs of honeysuckle yellow as butter full of scent then he waited for her she was hanging her head looking in the hedge bottom he presented her with the flowers without speaking she bent forward inhaled the rich fragrance and looked up at him over the blossoms with her beautiful beseeching blue eyes he smiled gently to her isn't it nice he said aren't they fine bits she took them without answering and put one piece carefully in her dress it was quite against her rule to wear a flower he took his place by her side i always like the gold green of cut fields he said they seem to give off sunshine even when the sky is greyer than a tabby cat she laughed instinctively putting out her hand towards the glowing field on her right they entered the larch wood there the chill wind was changed into sound like a restless insect he hovered about her like a butterfly whose antennae flicker and twitch sensitively as they gather intelligence touching the aura as it were of the female he was exceedingly delicate in his handling of her the path was cut windingly through the lofty dark and closely serried trees which vibrated like chords under the soft bow of the wind now and again he would look down passages between the trees narrow pillared corridors dusky as if webbed across with mist all round was a twilight 
thickly populous with slender silent trunks helena stood still gazing up at the treetops where the bow of the wind was drawn causing slight perceptible quivering Byrne walked on without her at a bend in the path he stood with his hand on the roundness of a larch trunk looking back at her a blue fleck in the brownness of congregated trees she moved very slowly down the path i might as well not exist for all she is aware of me he said to himself bitterly nevertheless when she drew near he said brightly have you noticed how the thousands of dry twigs between the trunks make a brown mist a broom she looked at him suddenly as if interrupted hmm yes i see what you mean she smiled at him because of his bright boyish tone and manner that's the larch fog he laughed yes she said you see it in pictures i had not noticed it before he shook the tree on which his hand was laid it laughs through its teeth he said smiling playing with everything he touched as they went along she caught swiftly at her hat then she stooped picking up her hat pin of twined silver she laughed to herself as if pleased by a coincidence last year she said the larch fingers stole both my pins the same ones he looked at her wondering how much he was filling the place of a ghost with warmth he thought of siegmund and seemed to see him swinging down the steep bank out of the wood exactly as he himself was doing at the moment with helena stepping carefully behind he always felt a deep sympathy and kinship with siegmund sometimes he thought he hated helena they had emerged at the head of a shallow valley one of those wide hollows in the north downs that are like a great length of tapestry held loosely by four people it was raining Byrne looked at the dark blue dots rapidly appearing on the sleeves of Helena's dress. They walked on a little way. The rain increased. Helena looked about for shelter. Here, said Byrne, here is our tent, a black tartar's, ready pitched. He stooped under the low boughs of a very large yew tree that stood just back from the path she crept after him it was really a very good shelter burn sat on the ledge of a root helena beside him he looked under the flap of the black branches down the valley the grey rain was falling steadily the dark hollow under the tree was immersed in the monotonous sound of it in the open where the bright young corn shone intense with wet green was a fold of sheep exposed in a large pen on the hillside they were moving restlessly now and again came the tong ting tong of a sheep bell first the grey creatures huddled in the high corner then one of them descended and took shelter by the growing corn lowest down the rest followed bleating and pushing each other in their anxiety to reach the place of desire which was no whit better than where they stood before that's like us all said burn whimsically we're all penned out on a wet evening but we think if only we could get where someone else is it would be deliciously cosy helena laughed swiftly as she always did when he became whimsical and fretful he sat with his head bent down smiling with his lips but his eyes melancholy she put her hand out to him he took it without apparently observing it folding his own hand over it 
and unconsciously increasing the pressure you are cold he said only my hands and they usually are she replied gently and mine are generally warm i know that she said it's almost the only warmth i get now your hands they really are wonderfully warm and close touching as good as a baked potato he said she pressed his hand scolding him for his mockery so many calories per week isn't that how we manage it he asked on credit she put her other hand on his as if beseeching him to forego his irony which hurt her they sat silent for some time the sheep broke their cluster and began to straggle back to the upper side of the pen tong 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 went the forlorn bell the rain waxed louder Burn was thinking of the previous week he had gone to helena's home to read german with her as usual she wanted to understand wagner in his own language in each of the armchairs reposing across the arms was a violin case he had sat down on the edge of one seat in front of the sacred fiddle helena had come quickly and removed the violin i shan't knock it it is all right he had said protesting this was siegmund's violin which helena had managed to purchase and burn was always ready to yield its precedence it was all right he repeated but you were not she had replied gently since that time his heart had beat quick with excitement now he sat in a little storm of agitation of which nothing was betrayed by his gloomy pondering expression but some of which was communicated to helena by the increasing pressure of his hand which adjusted itself delicately in a stronger and stronger stress over her fingers and palm by some movement he became aware that her hand was uncomfortable he relaxed she sighed as if restless and dissatisfied she wondered what he was thinking of he smiled quietly the babes in the wood he teased helena laughed with a sound of tears in the tree overhead some bird began to sing in spite of the rain a broken evening song that little beggar sees it's a hopeless case so he reminds us of heaven but if he's going to cover us with yew leaves he's set himself a job helena laughed again and shivered he put his arm round her drawing her nearer his warmth after this new and daring move neither spoke for a while the rain continues he said and will do she added laughing quite content he said the bird overhead chirruped loudly again strew on us roses roses quoted burn adding after a while in wistful mockery and never a sprig of you eh helena made a small sound of tenderness and comfort for him and weariness for herself she let herself sink a little closer against him shall it not be so no you he murmured he put his left hand with which he had been breaking larch twigs on her chilled wrist noticing that his fingers were dirty he held them up i shall make marks on you he said they will come off she replied yes we come clean after everything time scrubs all sorts of scars off us some scars don't seem to go she smiled and she held out her other arm which had been pressed warm against his side 
there just above the wrist was the red sun inflammation from last year Byrne regarded it gravely but it's wearing off even that he said wistfully helena put her arms round him under his coat she was cold she felt a hot wave of joy suffuse him almost immediately she released him and took off her hat that is better he said i was afraid of the pins said she i've been dodging them for the last hour he said laughing as she put her arms under his coat again for warmth she laughed and making a small moaning noise as if of weariness and helplessness she sank her head on his chest he put down his cheek against hers i want rest and warmth she said in her dull tones all right he murmured end of chapter 31 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey end of the trespasser by d h lawrence